History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spooktacular people. Welcome to this 401st episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast, Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I'm your host, Diane. And this is Kelly. Kelly, on this episode, we're doing a location suggested to us by listener Christina Orff, and that is Hannibal, Missouri. This place has a lot of haunts going on. Looking forward to it. It also happens to be the hometown of Mark Twain, so bonus. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Before we get into that, we want to welcome some people into our Spooktacular crew, and I will apologize now. Facebook, as they are always changing the way they do things, seems to have changed the way that they list members. Usually they put the most recent people to come in at the top, but when I saw that Jerry Polly was sitting at the top of our new members list, I was like, hmm, something strange is going on here. Did he accidentally leave and have to come back? And then I saw your name next, Kelly. (laughs) I know, these stupid (laughs) algorithms. I don't know what they ever think that they're improving because it seems like they just mess it up more. So hopefully we get everybody who joined this last week. If I miss you, we do apologize. Absolutely. Andrea, Tracy with an I, Bethany, which is just an NY at the end, Serena, John, Daniel, Madison, Mary, Isaac, Donnie, and Alexandra. Thank you for joining us in the Spooktacular crew. And now, this moment, Nodity. The moment in Oddity was suggested by Tim McCrimmon. Sophia McLaughlin was a young girl who died in 1879. A plaque erected near her grave in Nova Scotia tells the sad story and the odd circumstances around her death. Sophia, aged 14, apprenticed to Mrs. Trask, dressmaker, carrying on a business at what is now the site of 242 Lincoln Street, was accused by her employer of the theft of a princely sum of $10. Pleading her innocence, Sophia became ill, often observed lying on her sister's grave near here. Sophia's grief was added to by her mother's acceptance of Mrs. Trask's story. Sophia's condition worsened, confining her to a room at what is now the site of 169 Pelham Street. At the insisting of a friend, a doctor was called, but he could not prevent her death. Amid much speculation by members of the community, a coroner's jury was summoned to hold an inquiry into Sophia's death. The unanimous decision for the cause of her death was by paralysis of the heart brought on by extreme agitation and peculiar circumstances. The passing of Sophia was not forgotten, and sometime afterwards, Mrs. Trask's son admitted to the theft. Mrs. Trask and her son moved from Lunenburg, and no record of their place of residing exists. Sophia's family maintained their residence in Lunenburg, where Sophia's father plied his trade as a shipwright. Those who knew Sophia remembered her as a pretty girl who will not be forgotten. A young teenager dying from what was basically ruled as a broken heart certainly is odd. Pull the covers up tight. That chill you feel isn't the air conditioning. (laughs) And now, this month in history. In the month of September, on the 20th in 1973, the Battle of the Sexes tennis match was held, and Billie Jean King won. The match was held between Billie Jean King, who was the top women's tennis player at the time, and Bobby Riggs, who was a former number one ranked men's tennis player. King was 29 at the time, and Riggs was 55. Riggs was a self-proclaimed male chauvinist, and he said that women couldn't compete against men, and that even at his age, he could beat any female player. 
King took him up on that challenge and the event became a huge media event, with over 50 million people viewing worldwide and 30,000 spectators watching in person at the Houston Astrodome. Riggs rode into the court in a rickshaw pulled by female models, and King was carried on a gold litter carried by men dressed as ancient slaves. Howard Cosell reported the match in which King won in straight sets, 6-4, 6-3, 6-3. King continued her push for women's rights, which included fair pay, and in 1973, the U.S. Open was the first major tennis event to pay both genders the same amount of prize money. Hannibal, Missouri is known as America's hometown, and author Mark Twain helped to put it on the map as this was his boyhood home. This was a quintessential river town with many men traveling here to make their fortune, and they did. Many stately homes that were built during its heyday are still around today. Some of them are beds and breakfasts that you can book for a stay, and many of these have ghost stories to go with them. Join us as we share the history and haunts of Hannibal, Missouri. Hannibal was founded using two land grants issued after the mighty earthquake of 1811 destroyed the small town of New Madrid in Missouri and caused, get this Kelly, caused the Mississippi River to change course and flow backward for a time. Oh my word. (laughs) Now I know your experience with earthquakes having come from California. True. Can you imagine having one strong enough that reverses the Mm, mighty Mississippi? The town was surveyed in 1819 and Moses D. Bates cleared the land and started constructing buildings. Hannibal got its name around 1800 when Spanish surveyor Don Antonio Solard drew a map of the area. And that's all it said? So I'm like, okay, he gave it the name, but where did he get it? Did he just pick somebody's he name? Picked it out of the air? <laughs> I mean, I know there's a Hannibal Lecter. Oh my. <laughs> Who did he name it for? The town had a slow start with only a couple of dozen people arriving to settle in its first decade. By 1860, it was thriving, though, particularly with the arrival of the railroads. Lumber would become the top product coming through Hannibal. Logs would be floated down from Minnesota and Wisconsin, and sawmills at Hannibal would mill the lumber and then float it south on the river or ship it by rail to the west. Lumber barons would build their mansions in the town. But what really makes Hannibal a famous place is Mark Twain. He grew up here and based his book, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, on his childhood growing up in the small town. He writes about many of the superstitions and spiritual beliefs of both the white citizens and those of color, some of whom had been slaves. This is also a river town with lots of limestone. We talked about a limestone cave in Hannibal in episode 342 that featured Dr. McDowell, who put his daughter in a copper tube in that cave. Mark Twain wrote of this. There's an interesting cave a mile or two below Hannibal. In my time, the person who then owned it turned it into a mausoleum for his daughter, age 14. The body was put into a copper cylinder filled with alcohol, and this was suspended in one of the dismal avenues of the cave. The top of the cylinder was removable, and it was a common thing for the baser order of tourists to drag the dead face into view and examine it and comment upon it. Perhaps because of the river and limestone, there are a few haunted places in this town. Our first stop here in Hannibal is Lulabelle's Bed and Breakfast. Lulabelle's Bed and Breakfast had been a fine dining establishment and bed and breakfast located at 111 Bird Street. It's our understanding that this location closed in 2013, and I don't believe anything else has moved into that. So I'm assuming this has been abandoned. If you are near Hannibal or have been through there recently, let us know, because that was all I could find about it. This establishment has an infamous history as a brothel that was built in 1917 and run by a madam who had arrived from Chicago. Her name was Sarah Smith, and men could not only enjoy the ladies here, they could gamble and drink during Prohibition. Obviously, this business flourished. When Sarah died in 1932, another madam named Bessie Heolsher bought the bordello and refurbished it, decorating it with a lavish Spanish motif. Bessie took good care of her girls and paid well. The ladies here were highly sought out because of their discretion. Guess they didn't let a lot of people know which men were coming to visit. 
the ladies were respected in town and the women were happy to spend their money on the finer things, which is probably why they were respected in town. If you're going to spend all your dough here, you're welcome. Things went well until the early 1950s when local church leaders made it their goal to shut down the brothel, and it was plagued with many police raids. Eventually, Mike and Pam Ginsburg bought the property and opened it as Lulabelle's Bed and Breakfast and a fine dining restaurant. The upper floor had six rooms with heart-shaped whirlpool bathtubs and queen-size beds. The Ginsburgs expanded their business by buying two nearby properties. One they named the Painted Lady with two bedrooms and the Main Street Bed and Breakfast that had three rooms. Business was great for a while and people raved about the food at the restaurant. But eventually the economy just proved too hard to keep the establishment open. While it was open, there were stories of haunting activity. Guests who stayed on the upper floor claimed to hear disembodied footsteps and voices, to see shadowy and misty forms, to see small balls of light, to have their doors locked and unlocked by something they couldn't see to be touched, and to have furnishings and objects in the rooms moved around. Employees and guests claim to see a lady in white as well. So we got one of those here. I always thought I'd love to write a book about the lady in white, but I'd be writing and writing and, and writing. writing. <laughs> <laughs> one area with a lot of activity was the kitchen. Metal cooking utensils would be moved. Equipment would turn on and off by itself. Disembodied voices were heard. Shadow figures were seen, especially out of the corner of the eye. And objects were thrown in the kitchen. It might be that the food was bad. I don't know. Oh, could be. Just hope they weren't throwing knives. Spirits have been seen in the mirrors that were in the dining room as well. The Paranormal Task Force and a crew from KZZK investigated in October of 2008, and they stayed overnight. They reported on their website, some heard the voice of a lady who they could not see, while others heard unexplainable footsteps. Moving areas of notable temperature decreases were also documented, along with intelligent interaction by the unseen with an investigator's electromagnetic field, EMF meter. One investigator was actually touched by the unseen when something softly stroked his arm with a special cold touch. A crew member of the KZZK team actually became so frightened that she ran out of the building screaming. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I just, I don't know. We've been in some haunted locations, and I just can't imagine somebody running out of a building screaming. Well, it depends upon... I mean, if you're already an investigator, then I would imagine... Well, this is this not... Is the, this is the... This is just somebody TV from... TV crew or radio yeah, crew. Okay. I think it's a radio station. I'm not sure. But. <laughs> Intelligent communication was also received through an experimental device called the Ovilus, which was being field tested by our team at this location. I thought that was interesting that they had that in there because this is back in 2008. So that's kind of when the Ovilus, I guess, appeared on the market. Sure. The words sex and pain were said by this device multiple times. It even said the name of a KZZK crew member when he was near it on more than one occasion. Multiple Class B and C EVPs were captured. Which I don't find as impressive because those you just never know. Was it actually something said or just a noise that it picked up? Next, we have the Java Jive Coffee and Tea Shop. Java Jive Coffee and Tea used to be Java Jive, and before that, it was Hayden Hardware. And that is what our ghost here seems to be connected to, the hardware store. It was named for Percy Hayden, who was the owner and described as a man who was a little gruff and never without a cigar in his mouth, but kind. He loved his store, which he had started in 1919. When he passed away, Jerry Adkins took over the reins, and he was the first to start experiencing weird events. He was in the restroom one night when he heard someone walking loudly outside of the door. He thought an employee was fooling around, and so he thought he'd surprise them by jumping out of the door. He swung the door open and found that there was no one near the restroom. So you imagine him jumping out the door. Boo! And he's like, <laughs> there's nobody here. Crickets. Adkins was closing up one evening with an employee when they heard a really loud sneeze. They looked at each other and realized that neither of them had sneezed. They checked the store for another person, even though they knew they were the only ones there. And of course, they were right. Employees at Hayden's Hardware heard disembodied footsteps, particularly on the stairway leading to the ground floor, and the lights would turn on and off by themselves. Percy seemed to be a prankster, a ghost after my own heart. <laughs> and whenever something would go wrong in the store, employees would blame Percy. One such prank disturbed a female employee when she was closing up one night. Her name was repeatedly whispered in her ear. When Java Jive moved into the space, the haunting activity continued. Those employees heard disembodied footsteps too, but their experiences went beyond just Percy. They heard women talking. 
the laughter of children, and music that seemed to belong in a dance hall or saloon. A woman's crying is heard near the restroom. Baristas claim to have been touched by something they can't see on many occasions. The bell at the front counter rings on its own, and an employee heard a male voice yell in her ear. The shadow of a large man has been spotted, and Percy was said to have been an overweight man. Another employee had her purse disappear when she stopped by one night after hours. She had set it down while she used the restroom. She and her boyfriend looked everywhere for it and eventually found it in a crevice down in the basement. Now, we have to assume that her boyfriend wasn't being a little bit of a prankster here. It's pretty weird to have it show up on a floor that they weren't even on and then it's shoved in a crevice. Somebody did not want her to find that purse. Right. Next up, we have the Garth Woodside Mansion. This was built in 1871, and at the time of our recording in September 2021, it was up for sale for a cool $1.9 million, Kelly. Wow. But this is down from its original ask of $2.4 million. Quite a bargain. Hey. <laughs> History goes bump spectacular crew clubhouse. Yeah, because that's totally in the budget. <laughs> <laughs> this is a beautiful Victorian built in the Second Empire Italian at architectural style with a large wraparound veranda. See, we'd have room for everybody. There were originally six buildings on the property, but two were barns that have been torn down. Three cottages on the property were built in the 2000s, and the entire property covers 36 acres. Weddings were also hosted here. The mansion was opened as a bed and breakfast in 1987 with 11 rooms in the main house and five in the three cottages. The larger cottage has two fireplaces, and the main house had 14. 85% of the furnishings are original to the house. Pretty amazing. That is. The most recent owners were John and Julie, and I have no idea what their last name is because they don't have it on the website. Alrighty then. But I'm assuming these are the people who are selling it. The mansion is named for John Garth. He is thought to be the inspiration behind the character of Tom Sawyer. He was born to John and Emily Garth in Virginia in 1837. The family moved to Hannibal in 1844, where John's father got into the tobacco business. In Hannibal, John met Helen Kercheval and Samuel Clements. The group were all students at Mrs. Elizabeth's Horse School, and later at that of J.D. Dawson. They remained friends into their adulthood, with John and Helen even getting married on October 18, 1860. They had two children, John David and Annie. John went away to college, but returned to help run the tobacco business with his brother after their father died. When the Civil War broke out, the Garths left for New York and stayed there until 1871, with John making a fortune working in banking and manufacturing. When the Garths returned to Hannibal, John started several businesses and became vice president of the Farmers and Merchants Bank, eventually becoming the president. The Garths purchased a farm southwest of Hannibal and built their summer home there, dubbing it Woodside. They raised and bred Shorthorn and Jersey cattle. John got into lumber and other business prospects. They exchanged letters with Clemens and hosted him in their home. John was probably one of the boys who provided Clemens with inspiration for the character Tom Sawyer. When Twain's book, Life on the Mississippi, was released, he sent the Gars a copy, and John wrote to Twain, Thanks for the book. Each and every one at Woodside has enjoyed it greatly. Twain also had a copy of Huckleberry Finn set to the Gars upon its release. John Garth died in 1899, and Helen died in 1923. Helen was successful in her own right, getting involved in the same businesses as her husband, and she was even elected to the board of the Farmers and Merchants Bank in 1910, making her the first woman bank director in Hannibal. Mark Twain wrote in his autobiography about Garth's cigars. In those days, the native cigar was so cheap that a person who could afford anything could afford cigars. Mr. Garth had a great tobacco factory, and he also had a small shop in the village for the retail sale of his products. He had one brand of cigars, which even poverty itself was able to buy. He had these in stock a good many years, and although they looked well enough on the outside, their insides had decayed dust and would fly out like a puff of vapor when they were broken in two. This brand was very popular on account of its extreme cheapness. Mr. Garth had other brands which were cheap and some that were bad, but the supremacy over them enjoyed by this brand was indicated by its name. It was called Garth's Damnedest. We used to trade old newspapers for that brand. Alrighty then. <laughs> I just... <laughs> I mean, you have to be pretty desperate for some cigars if you're going to take something that's like a moldy old cigar and smoke it. I That couldn't have been... I mean, it's not good for your lungs anyway, but I mean, extremely yeah. bad with that. <laughs> Mark Twain seems to have really loved visiting this home because his spirit is said to haunt the place. The room that has been named for him is where his apparition is seen most often. There are eerie orbs of light in there and the smell of pipe smoke course maybe they had other people who smoked a pipe in there so you don't know for sure 
Next up, we have the Garden House Bed and Breakfast. The Garden House Bed and Breakfast is part of Hannibal's Millionaire Row. This is a beautiful example of Queen Anne architecture, and the house was built in 1895 by Albert Wells Pettibone Jr., who was heir to the Hannibal Sawmill Company and the Hannibal Sash and Company. Tragedy struck early for Albert, and he died at the age of 29. The house was then bought in 1905 by Charles H. Trowbridge, who owned the Duffy Trowbridge Stove Manufacturing Company. The house was inherited by his son Charles Albert, who lived in it in the 1920s. Will Griswold, who was the founder of a furniture store, was the next owner. So you can see that this home passed through many hands. The Garden House Bed and Breakfast opened in 2003, featuring old-fashioned feather beds and hand-sewn comforters. Today, it is veteran-owned and operated by Chris. This B&B was named by the Today Show as one of the top 10 places to sleep with a ghost in America. Apparently, they investigated the place themselves, but couldn't get their cameras to work in the attic. The cool thing about this place is that they embrace their spirits, even hanging a picture in the dining room that shows a man sitting at a table and what appears to be the ghost of a boy peeking into the side of the picture with just his face visible. The sounds of sawing are heard coming from the basement, and the sound of piano music is heard on the first floor. Disembodied voices are heard throughout the house. A ghost hunter witnessed a shadowy figure walk in front of the television while investigating in 2006. Melissa Sexton was a manager at La Bina Bistro, and she stayed a few nights at the garden. She ended up leaving the bed and breakfast after a few nights and found lodging elsewhere because of the experiences she was having. She heard disembodied footsteps and smelled men's cologne. Melissa had her Siberian husky with her, and he clearly started reacting to things she couldn't see. The final straw for Melissa was when she saw what she described as a translucent figure which scrambled away in the kitchen that seemed to bounce off the walls and then to concentrate itself into a blue dot. She left the bed and breakfast for other lodgings and soon after left Hannibal. So she's like, I'm even done with the city. I thought you were going to say old men cologne. <laughs> old men cologne. Well, like you know, old, old I guess fair's perfume. fair. If I'm going to say old ladies perfume, I should say old man's cologne. What would that be? Old Spice? even though it's supposedly gotten hip nowadays again. I kind of like Old Spice. Okay. <laughs> Aqua Velvet. How about that? Is that an old man? Velva. Oh, I don't even know <laughs> what it's called. Is, was it called Aqua Velva? Yeah. Oh, I always thought it was Aqua Velvet. No. Bitch or something. <laughs> my dad used to wear, what was the name? Old English, I think. I can't remember what my dad wore. It was something that my mom got from Avon. Arif Dagan stayed at the bed and breakfast and helped out the innkeeper Chris as an assistant from 2006 to 2010. Arif was left one weekend in charge. There was only one guest that first evening, and Arif came down the following morning to find the usually fully set dining room completely amiss with silverware scattered all around the tables. He thought the guest had done it. That guest left, and there was a new one that evening. Arif came down the following morning to once again find the dining room messed up. And he knew it wasn't possible that he had two guests that rude right in a row. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> they both just had the same idea. I'm going to just go down here and mess up all the silverware. This happened on a third morning and Arif was the only person in the house. So he knew at this point that something weird was going on here. I would have thought that after the first morning. <laughs> yeah. Some guests can be rude, but I can't imagine somebody would go in and just mess up all the silverware just for fun. Arif was home alone again in 2007, and he was awakened after midnight by the sound of footsteps stomping around downstairs. He was scared because he thought someone had broken into the house. He locked his bedroom door and grabbed a nearby bottle to use as a weapon. He listened as the footsteps came upstairs and went into the room next to his. He then summoned his courage and went out into the hallway. The door was unlocked, so he pushed it open and flipped on the light. There was no one there. Arif called out, hello, and then he searched the room. He found no one in the house, and so he returned to his room, but soon heard footsteps running down the stairs. He quickly ran to the stairs and heard the footsteps stop halfway down the stairs. There was no one on the stairs. Arif searched the house, and when he went to the front door, he found that the screen door was still locked from the inside. When Arif told Chris about this experience, Chris said, you know that's the ghost. What's Some amazing information I could have used before you left me by myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what's amazing to me is he hears these footsteps. He goes to the room next door where he thinks he hears them. And it's like, did the ghost see him come into the room and then go, oh, I'm busted. And then he's like, I got to get out of here. And then he runs back down the stairs and out. Just no weird. clue. <laughs> Someone wrote in 2019, 
My wife and I slept in the West Room at the Garden House in Hannibal, Missouri, both Thursday and Friday nights, February 21st and 22nd, 2019. Thursday night, both of us woke up hearing men in lengthy conversation in low voices downstairs. We were the only guests in the house and Chris. The proprietor assured us he was not in conversation with anyone that evening. My wife also reported to Chris that there was no spoon at her breakfast place setting Friday morning, just after being told by Chris that it had been a common occurrence for guests to notice missing pieces of flatware the following morning at breakfast. We never felt threatened in this wonderful period mansion and would definitely like to return for another stay at the garden house. Somebody in that house likes silverware. Don't know why. They're just pranksters. And finally, we have Rockcliffe Mansion. This is a gorgeous Gilded Age estate that sits on a limestone bluff overlooking Hannibal. Looks absolutely gorgeous. Looks like it has gorgeous views of the Mississippi. Just a wonderful place. The mansion was built by St. Louis architectural firm Barnett, Haynes, and Barnett for lumber baron John J. Cruikshank Jr., Construction lasted for two years between 1898 and 1900, and the house was done in the Georgian Revival architectural style. The house features double bricked walls, so this house was built to last. No expense was spared on the interior. Windows featured Louis Comfort Tiffany stained glass windows, and there were also chandeliers by Tiffany. The fireplaces featured South African pink marble, and the walls and stairways featured hand-carved and ornate woodwork made from walnut, mahogany, and oak with lemon wood sideboards in the reception room. The plumbing fixtures were the finest made, and the lighting fixtures were custom-made, offering power via both gas and electric, which we've seen in a few homes that we've been in. Several rooms had gilded wallpaper, and the green room had the added touches of gold leaf and garlands, lace and velvet drapes, and white onyx around the fireplace. The music room had a grand piano on each end. Can you imagine how big that room has to be in order to hold two grand pianos? Definitely. John lived there with his wife and four daughters until his death in 1924. And then it seems that the family moved out and left the house abandoned. This wonderful mansion sat for 43 years with only a caretaker there. Parts of the house were deteriorating until three families bought it to prevent it from being demolished in 1967. These families restored the house and even got many original pieces from one of the Crookshank daughters. The mansion was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1980 and is open for tours and runs as a bed and breakfast with 30 rooms. It has passed through many hands through the years. There was a Mary and Jerry McAvoy, then Ken and Lisa Marks, and then Warren Bittner and Juan Ruiz Bello of Florida, who took over in 2010. And I think they're still the current owners of it. I'm not for sure about that. But when I was looking at reviews, it looked like Juan was the one who was responding to a lot of them. And that was like in 2019 and such. There are several spirits at the mansion. The main one belongs to John Crookshank, who died in the house. He appears as a small man wearing a brown felt hat and a period suit with a goatee and mustache. His ghost is seen all over the mansion, and many guests report seeing him standing by the bar in the kitchen on the ground floor and floating through the grand music room. I don't know if both of the pianos are still there, if he's floating between the pianos, or... One of the first people to see John's ghost was Mary McAvoy, who was caretaker at the mansion from 1993 to 2005. She was two years into the job when she was sleeping alone in a second-floor guest room. Her husband had lived at the house, too, but he was away on a trip. She heard someone open the door to the servant's entrance, and she sat up and looked at the clock. It was 2 a.m. She then heard footsteps walking up the back staircase and heading to John's old room. There was no one else in the mansion when she checked. This routine has happened several times in the house, and people figure John is returning to the large canopy bed where he breathed his last breath. Many times, tour guides come into the house in the morning, and when they check the bed, they find the impression of a person left on the bed that they had fluffed the night before. Who's been sleeping in my bed? <laughs> Another spirit here is said to belong to Mark Twain. This is not an apparition that appears, but rather manifests in the odor of cigar smoke. I wonder if that's the decayed, decayed cigars. cigars? <laughs> you? He's smoking one of those damnedest cigars. Guides claim that sometimes they have to leave the room because the scent is so strong. It must be the Garth's damnedest. I bet it is. <laughs> this thing stinks. Twain was only at the mansion once, and that was in 1902, to deliver his farewell to Hannibal speech. So it seems a bit strange that Twain would haunt this place as he was only there a brief time. And clearly, other people probably smoked cigars in this house. Perhaps this is something residual. 
I'm getting the feeling that Mark Twain is very much like Rudolph Valentino, Marilyn Monroe. They just haunt all kinds of places. They're just everywhere. Ken and Lisa Marks have written the Haunted Hannibal book, and they purchased Rockcliffe. Their experiences started almost immediately. They were careful to lock all the doors because lots of curious people would stop by the mansion. So they were perplexed when they started hearing doors slamming downstairs when they were on the second floor sleeping. These weren't just regular slams either. They were really loud as though the door was opening as wide as possible and then slamming shut. So somebody wanted to be heard. Other times they would be downstairs and hear furniture moving upstairs and disembodied footsteps. One of the tour guides told the Marks that she had seen the ghost of John three times. Two times were very brief glimpses, but the third one lingered. John was standing by the pantry and then slowly disappeared, and that is how the guide knew this was not a real man. Lisa tells the following story in Alan Brown's Ghost Along the Mississippi River. We were in the office one night and we heard a crashing sound. It took us 20 minutes of searching to find out what had happened. In the girls' bedroom is a closet containing a lot of dresses. We had placed a vase of artificial flowers on a shelf in the closet. When we walked into the room, we saw where the vase had shattered, but it wasn't like it had just fallen off the shelf in the closet. It fell into the room several feet away from the closet. I picked up the pieces of glass and put them at the base of an oak tree just outside the door, almost like an offering. The Marks have had guests leave in the middle of the night because they were scared by phantom music playing or ghostly footsteps. That's not good for business. When Alan Brown stayed with his wife Marilyn at Rockcliffe, she had an experience. And I have to say, I've been at a talk that Alan Brown has given. I have a ton of his books, too. And he takes his wife Marilyn to all these places with him. He's never once had an experience, but she has lots. So he calls her like the ghost magnet and he just sleeps through everything. (laughs) So they're staying at Rockcliffe. She gets up to use the restroom around 2 a.m. She returned to bed and heard footsteps out in the hallway. The kinds of steps that a child would make are possibly a woman, so they weren't real heavy. And then the doorknob started to rattle. Marilyn decided not to open the door. Probably a good idea. They'd been the only guests at the bed and breakfast, and Lisa told them it wasn't her or Ken either. Hannibal has its mysterious caves and historic locations infused with history. Many think that this is one really haunted little town. Are these locations in Hannibal, Missouri haunted? That is for you to decide. Well, it sounds like a cool place to visit. We are occasionally in Missouri, although we're usually more in the St. Louis area. True. But I wouldn't mind checking it out someday. And Kiwi's nodding his head, so I think he wants to go too. (laughs) I was going to say, he's clearly agreeing, bouncing around, bobbing his head. We'd love to have you guys check out our website at historygoesbump.com. And if you'd like to send us some feedback, you can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. So we got an email from Josie. She says, Dear Diane, Dear Kelly, my name is Josie. I am 17 years old and live in Germany. So pretty cool. We don't have a lot of German listeners. So very cool. I just wanted to tell you that I love your show and I wanted to congratulate you on the 400th episode of the podcast. Personally, I found your podcast about six months ago and since then I've been listening to it constantly. The episode that's baffled me the most has been 358 Ghosts of Whitechapel. I've been to Whitechapel, London with my mom before. And we also visited Hanbury Street because I really wanted to see the street art. I'm an artist myself, so I really wanted to see this. Unfortunately, it was raining heavily when we got there and we didn't stay for a very long time. However, when we walked down that street, I had a really uneasy feeling and I got all restless and had the sudden urge to run. I literally had no idea that Annie Chapman was killed here and I wish I'd known. I don't know if the feeling I had had anything to do with this tragic event, but now that I know about this, I can't help but think about it. Have you ever had something like this happen to you on a ghost tour? And another question completely unrelated to my story. You've talked about all kinds of haunted places like castles, hotels, restaurants, asylums, prisons. And I was wondering if you would consider doing an episode on a haunted amusement park of some sort. I bet that would be interesting too. Anyway, thank you really very much for your amazing work on the show. Your podcast is so amazing. Well, thank you so much. What a wonderful compliment. So I wrote back to her and I'll let you expound on this a little bit. Um, I just, you know, let her know that it was very exciting to have a listener from Germany and that glad that she's enjoying the podcast. And I let her know I am as sensitive as a rock, but Kelly is sensitive. And I know that you've had feelings inside of locations, but have you ever had anything outside of a location or in a haunted outdoor area? I mean, I, I've certainly had different things happen. For example, that blue light that I saw and then caught with my camera at yeah. Pike, I was drawn over to that area. I get drawn to places. Okay. 
I haven't had like anything significantly overwhelming and I've never had anything that made me fearful. I've definitely felt oppression Mm -hmm. when walking through locations such as maybe the spirits don't want me to go there. Mm -hmm. I'm just always very respectful and and kind, but say, okay, well, I'm here and I'm going to remain here and I'm still walking through here. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I've obviously I don't get any of those kinds of feelings, really. And I've never heard anybody say that they've had an urge to run, but I definitely think it's a possibility, especially you can only imagine the fear the spiritual residue left mm-hmm. behind by the Jack the Ripper killings. Absolutely. I did let her know that we did an episode on Disneyland, so she probably missed that somewhere along the line. And I got to thinking, Kelly, next month is October. It is. It's a 50 year birthday for a couple of things. Really? Yeah. One of them's me. Oh, that's right. And Disney <laughs> at Disney World, the Magic Kingdom, just happened to miss my birthday by 13 days. If they would have just waited till the 14th, they would have had it down. Shame on them. The Magic Kingdom is going to celebrate 50 years on October 1st. So I'm thinking that in October we'll be doing, maybe we'll do it at the end of this month, a haunted Walt Disney World. Sounds like a plan. Okay. And we did do a bonus cast on an abandoned amusement park called Lake Shawnee, which is really creepy. I know it's been on like America's Scariest Locations or something. I don't know. One of those shows. But uh, it has a lot of creepy stuff going on there. It's hard to find haunted amusement parks. And I was hoping this October we were going to be going to Not Scary Farm. I know. But unfortunately, our finances are just not going to make it so that we can head out to California at this time. But something for the future. We want to thank you guys for tuning into this episode. I've been your host, Diane. And this has been Kelly. You take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We want to welcome back Tiffany Newcomer. She and Dan are going to be placed in a garden crypt, Kelly. Thank you so much for supporting History Goes Bump. And we're so bummed Dan is getting deployed. So they were supposed to be at our live show and ghost hunt and they're not going to be able to join us. Super bummed. Well wishes and prayers for Dan to be safe. Exactly. And you guys might recall they joined us for the USS North Carolina episode. They sure did. And we want to welcome into the cemetery Mindy Anderson, Ann Wimmer, Nacha Bada, I think is how she says her name. It is Apache. She said, just call me Renee if you can't say that. <laughs> right. We didn't quite have a pronunciation key, so hopefully we're somewhere in the, the <laughs> A realm. little bit right. All of them are going to be getting chest tombs. So welcome to you ladies. Thank you so much for supporting History Goes Bump. We really could not produce this show without you. Have a spooky experience that occurred at an historic location? Want to give us feedback or have a suggestion for the show? Share it with us at historygoesbump at gmail.com. And now, this moment, Nodity. And now, this month in history. You know, I love that we bat our eyes at each other when we <laughs> say those little <laughs> intros to these segments. You had this da 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 look on your face, <laughs> all <laughs> those facial expressions. So. I have to do something because I'm I just, just having mimicked a, it. <laughs> I'm having a frustrating morning, so it's like, I know. Rrr, rrr, rrr. I'll just <laughs> bat my eyes and everything will be better. <laughs> there you go. And I mean, somebody's having a frustrating morning out in the front room, oh, too. Oh, my goodness. Kiwi is in rare form. Oh, boy. Actually, not that rare. <laughs> no squawking and squawking so we know that most of the time you can't hear him too much so hopefully but he definitely wants to be part of the show right he now. does hannibal was founded using two land grants issued after the mighty earthquake of 1811 destroyed the small town of new Bridid. bippity boppity boo and sawmills at hannibal at hannibal hannibal they had a ball in hannibal they had a ball there We went down to Hannibal and had ourselves a ball.
This is also a river known with lots of limestone. This is also a river town known. What? How come you keep getting known out of town, Kelly? A T and a K and an N are just totally different. Intelligent communication was also received. <laughs> Would you like some spit with that? <laughs> I wasn't spitty. I just have it sloppy S's. It sounded like spit going through your teeth. I have sloppy S's or C's in this circumstance. Jaffa jive. Jaffa jive. Jaffa jive. It's a new dance with the mouth. <laughs> Jump jive and whale. You got it. <laughs> Maybe that's what I was getting into. Jump Jaffa jive, jive and whale. <laughs> All right, so for the first time, we actually have Kiwi sitting here while we are recording. Mm -hmm. We are hoping that that will help him to be quiet because today he is really, really going off. It's a, it's a microphone. It's fine. Kiwi's like looking at the microphone like, get that thing away from me. It's going to get me. <laughs> it's like climbing down Kelly's back to get away from it. The family moved to Hannibal in 1944. We're jumping forward 100 years. I'm just like tripping out. Several rooms had gilded wallpaper and the green room. And the green room. The green room. The green room. The green room. It's green like kiwi. Yeah, a green parrot. 